Love Talk Radio. Me chiamo Apura Kanu Apura Kainu. Ne ye a mind sim da. Ne dinde o jirapo. Kwesi rana in the ta aka. Pakamumana maruka e tipi mu o jirapo. O jiraman mu. Greetings to all Apura Kani Apura Kaini. People meaning African black people today. It's a mind sim day. Affairs of the Nation Day. My name is Ojirapo Kwesi Rana and Pata Akan. Ojirapo of the Akwamu Nation in North America. Within Ojirama, the purified nation. Akurakani, Akuraikani people in the Western Hemisphere. Yet I say we thank you once again for tuning into the broadcast. We are opening up the chat room now. If you have a question or a comment, and you want to interact in the chat room, you must uh, log in as a user in order to interact in the chat room. If you don't have a username, you can sign up for one quickly and log off. If you have a question or a comment on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised, and then we can connect with you on the phone line. For those who are new to the broadcast, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akanto Nanason, Ancient Authentic, Akan and Sesta Religion on Joda on Monday night, where we deal specifically with the Akan expression of ancestral religion. First and foremost, because we're Akan. Secondly, because of the misinformation being propagated regarding Akan culture, philosophy, ancestral religious practice, ritual, and practices and so forth, not only from individuals in the Western Hemisphere, but also from individuals on the continent who have been infected with white culture. So we deal with ancient, authentic, Akan ancestry religion from our ancient ancestresses and ancestors in Kana, which is a title of ancient Nubia, our migrations to the Western part of the continent to reestablish ancient Kana, the Ghana Empire, and then our migrations further south to reestablish Akana civilization in the forest belt Hundreds of years later, some of, our, some of our people were forced from those regions into North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Umusu or Kekia, the Great Diversity, the Enslavement Era. Yet we maintained our ancestral religious tradition, the Akan ancestral religion is Kudu in North America, Obia in Jamaica, um, we see in Suriname, and so forth. So we deal with that on Joda Monday night. On Benada, Abinada Tuesday nights, we have Ojida. Purification. We deal with ancestral religion, not just the Akan expression, but wherever we exist in the world, it's Afurakani, Afurakani people, and how our ancestral religious practices are in life. Every thought, every intention, every action must be aligned with divine order every moment of every day. That is the culture of Afurakani, Afurakani people. Our culture is powered by our ancestral religious practices. The ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. These are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. Through ritual, we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual, we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and thus realign ourselves with divine order. With the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance, the expansive and attractive poles of ancestral religion, no matter what form it takes. This is the S. Ojida or purification operationalizes Nanason. Purification operationalizes our approach to ritually incorporating law and ritually restoring God. So we deal with the purification culture concepts, ritual practices truth to reach, identity of these very different things on the Ojira broadcast. On Binada, Abinada, Tuesday night. On Wednesday night, Awukuda, Akuada, Wednesday, we have Egua Marketplace. We typically showcase an Afurakani Afurakani business organization or institution that is serving the Afurakani Afurakani community in a positive capacity who also maintain their ancestral religious values in the process of serving the community, and those values inform their service to the community. We showcase a business organization and institution on a weekly basis, and that is part of our OCOM economic development model. 
a model that we have published that you can download that model for free and, and read it, study it. We've also done some broadcasts where we dissect that model and show its application. Part of that Oklahoma economic development model, a model rooted in our ancestral religious values, therefore a holistic approach to economic development for Afrakani, Afrakani people. Part of that process is the strategy we use to start the beast and feed the cry. That means on a weekly basis we make a determination on what funds we would have wasted with the whites and their offspring in potential and then starve the beast and feed the cry. That means we reallocate those funds away from the black business to the white businesses to the black business organization or institution of the week. And we target one business organization or institution per week for 52 weeks for optimal capital infusion. So then when we start the beast and feed the cry and you take $10 away from the white business, you would have spent there directed to the black business of the week. That's a transfer of $10 when 1,000 people of of our people are focused on the home economic development model business of the week and transfer their $10 to the business of an infusion of $10,000 away from white businesses, which we have taken out of their hands and directed that $10,000 into the business, into the account of the business organization or institution of the week. That allows them, of course, to hire black people from the community in their business in the same week they have employment, they serve us at a greater capacity, they, that allows us to not have to be dependent on our enemies, the whites and our offspring, to provide those same products and services. We can simply shift over to the business organization or institution of the week. If we do not engage in that process, we leave those that $10,000 in the hands of our enemies, the whites and their offspring, empower them, and uh, basically finance our own oppression, sanctioning our own oppression. So, we engage that process on a weekly basis. The business organization or institution of the week for this week, because we had uh, this past weekend, the Abusida Sunday was our second annual Kudu Mine, Kudu Nation Festival. So, therefore, and that was on Sunday, a uh, great event. Again, yet I say to everyone who came out, that was the institution of the week. And therefore, it wasn't just one business, but it's an institution of the week. So that includes our presenters. When you go to the Okom Economic Development Model page, you will see the Who Do Mind, Who Do Nation Festival link page link. You can go to that page and you can support our presenters who came out, Ama Asase Aje, who's the owner of Asase Hills, and she talked about her healing pictures that she's uh, derived directly from plant life and mineral life and so forth rooted in a method given to her by her Insamanko, her communication with the Insamanko, her ancestors and ancestors in the Abosum of her blood circle. We have Asia Asase Retuo of Enchanted Pharmacy, as well as Asase Yeduru Creation. You can support her business. She spoke on Asumai, which are talismans and amulets, and the ritual impregnation of talismans and amulets with the Tumi, the power of our Insamanko, our ancestors and ancestors of our matric clans and patric clans, as well as the Tumi, the power of the Abosom, the divinities that are connected to our direct blood circles, impregnating that kind of Tumi, ancestral and deity, connected to us into these talismans and amulets for healing, for protection, for fertility, for offense and the defense of medicine and so forth. So we have those are our two presenters and we presented as well. You can visit their website, um, access their products and services and so forth. And then you will also see all part of the same uh, structure, our Egua marketplace that we had at the Udumayan Festival itself with a number of vendors. And all of those vendors, their ads and their links to their businesses, we have published in our Udumayan Udu Nation Festival Journal. We released that yesterday. We uh, upgraded it and added an additional uh, publication within the book. So we released that yesterday. The ebook version is on the website. The soft cover version is available as well, $8 and so forth. So um, all of the Egua Marketplace vendors, their links to their websites and so forth, we included in the business directory in the back of the book, as well as the links to, to our presenters' um, web pages and so forth, so you can access all of that information you can support. That's the business, or, or, or rather the institution of the week for this particular week of the Hudu Mai Hudu Nation Festival, so you can support in that way. All right. So, 
topic for tonight, Amain Sem. Amain means mission. Asem means issues, affairs of the nation. We are Ugira Amai, the purified Ugira Omai, nation. Omain, west, western hemisphere, land of the setting sun. So our designation, Ugira Amai, literally means the purified nation in the land of the setting sun in the west. Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people as a collective living in the Western Hemisphere on this region of Asase Afua, our fertile earth mother, and interfacing with her in this region as a collective and blending blood circles in this region while interfacing with Asase Afua, the earth mother in this region, and aligning ourselves with the Abosom, the forces in nature as they manifest in this region, forges within us as a collective, a locative identity. Based on the region we, of the Earth Mother we dwell upon, our interfacing with her, taking the energy of the Abosom as they manifest here into our bloodstream, blending blood circles with one another and so forth, we have forged a collective identity that's a unique collective of Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere we have returned to our ancestral religious practices, and therefore we are Ujida Man, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people, black people in the Western Hemisphere, descended from those who were forced into the Western Hemisphere during the Musuo Kesi, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. But we have forged our collective identity, locative identity once again, and we have purified ourselves. Now, when we talk about Ujida Man, the purified nation, we also focus here on Amanie, Amanie in the Akan language, and it's also God and Nature Commit, deals with the thing of the nation. We're talking about nationism, the purification of nationalism. So you can have secular nationalism, which is an empty approach to what we're trying to achieve. You can have a secular pan Africanism or an amorphous pan Africanism, which is abstract with no rooted identity or set of values that's only a skeleton of what we are seeking to achieve. When we deal with nationism, the purification of nationalism, we're grounded in the reality of our identity, rooted in the fact that we are part of a collective. A nation is a living, breathing entity that is governed by specific abosome and the components of the nation, the cells within that organ, the people who make up that specific, unique collective are governed by their own spirit, but they're also governed by the Abosom, the major divinities that animate that nation. When you have that kind of understanding of the identity of that specific collective, then you can make decisions that are in the best interest of the collective because you have a holistic view. You're in alignment with not only the collective of people, but the forces in nature that animate that collective. Now you're dealing with nationism, the purification of nationalism. So we have a nationist approach to solving our problem, a holistic approach rooted in our identity, rooted in our clan identity, rooted in our divine functioning creation. When you know what, what cell or kind of cell in the body you are, so you know what things you need to accept and what things you need to reject. You know there are certain things you engage in and certain things you do not engage in. The liver cells have a specific function. There are certain things, matters, the manner in which they operate, and there are other manners in which they do not operate. The immune system cells have their own specific uh, functions to execute. And there are lines of demarcation about how they should operate, parameters and so forth, and certain things they do not do. When you have your identity that's rooted in the abosom, the deities that govern you, that were assigned to you by, by Inyamewa Inyame, connected to your blood circle, and you understand what your ancestral clan is and what taboos are associated with you, what certain things that are acceptable, certain things that are objectionable and so forth, then you can make proper decisions about how you need to function in the world. What is your role in the nationist cause? If you don't understand your identity, you'll include all kinds of thoughts, intentions, actions, behaviors, values that are not conducive to the building and the maintaining and the defense of a nation. You start pulling in white values, which will be self-destructive and then destructive to the entire nation. Like somebody part of a collective and everyone is eating healthy and drinking pure spring water and everything else, 
and this person wants to come in and start smoking and poisoning the air for everybody who's in the room because they have a different set of values. They've embraced white values because they don't know who they are, so they just want to imitate anything outside of who they are, and that becomes self-destructive, whether it's dietary, whether it's social, whether it's spiritual, whether it's ritual, whether it's economical, whether it's political. Anytime you bring in values or you value specific things or behaviors or ideas or endeavors that are outside of how you are to function, the parameters within which you are to function, then you become self-destructive and then you become a liability for everyone else you're connected with. So this is what we deal with in online STEM affairs of the nation. Whatever issues arise, then we approach them from a nationist perspective, from an Amanie perspective, a rooted perspective. We did a broadcast last week of black activists, Afrocentric and African-centered agenda and exposing that agenda. This is black activists part two. You have black cultural hacks, hacking into the culture, perverting the culture, some through ignorance and some because they're criminal agents of the whites in their offspring, bringing in those foreign values foreign ideals that are perverse and deviant and criminal, trying to infect the culture of the people. These are cultural hacks. They're hacking themselves and trying to hack their way through the culture, trying to control our culture, pervert our culture. So there's, a, there's a great deal of black hacktivism going on and a great deal of black hacktivity. These hacktivists engage in hacktivity and hacktivism, cultural, and it's criminal and self-destructive. But it's easily exposed and destroyed and eradicated. One of the more recent iterations of this hacktivity, this idiotic hacktivity, this movement amongst some Negroes that African Americans aren't African. Of course, it's idiotic. It has roots in the white and their offspring. It was born, it was created, fashioned by the whites and their offspring. They've always sought, ever since they forced our people into the Western Hemisphere during the wars that we were waging against them, when they captured our prisoners of war, our warriors and warrioresses and sometimes children and so forth, they captured our people as prisoners of war and forced some of our people into the Western Hemisphere. The way to this possess the people of their drive to wage war against the whites and offspring and massacre them and kill them and make them docile slaves is to try to dispossess them of their culture. And the way you dispossess the people of their culture, their way of life, is to dispossess them of their identity. This is one of the reasons that our languages were banned. Dances and ritual practices and and so forth, were outlawed. Of course, our people continue to engage in them even though it was outlawed, but they outlawed them for a reason. They outlawed the achine, the drum, for a reason, because it was a means of communication. They didn't want us speaking our Apurakani, Apurakani languages because they couldn't understand them, but when we speak those languages, it ties us to our Intimako, it empowers us, it stimulates that fire within us to operate according to our culture, our way of life, and our way of life is to live in harmony with divine order, our way of life is an expression of divine order. The expression of divine order is law, divine law, divine love is the expression of order, divine hate is the impression of order. So when you embrace culture, if you're Afurakani, Afurakani, African, black, then you're embracing divine order. When you embrace divine order, you're embracing the expansive and contractive poles of divine order, which is divine law or love and divine hate. So when you embrace your culture, you're embracing divine hate. That means you hate your enemies, and you seek to kill your enemies, exterminate your enemies. You don't embrace your enemies, you kill them, you exterminate men, women, and babies, all of them. So when we enslave and force them to this condition, when we embrace our culture, we only seek to exterminate every white thing that's alive, men, women, and babies. So they have to dispossess us of the culture or the knowledge or memory of the culture. They first start by trying to outlaw language and practice and dances and songs and rituals and so forth. That wasn't working out, so they would take the children as soon as they are born 
and sell them away and ship them away to another plantation. Once you ship them away and they're raised in a foreign environment, they're never taught by their own parents their own language. They're never given a name from their own parents. They're shipped away to some other people on the plantation who had also been shipped away in a previous generation and were dispossessed of language and culture and so forth and were raised from children in America. Only thing they ever saw were white people in control and so forth and black people being enslaved. They want those children to be raised by such black people who are dispossessed of their culture. And once you dispossess them of their culture and identity and they just believe that they're inferior, then they will be docile slaves. And then you can give them Christianity and make them believe that fictional cartoon character Jesus is real and God is a white man and all this other nonsense. So these are the machinations that the whites in our spring were going through. They were trying to dispossess us of our identity because that is how you control the population. A population is not going to rise up and exterminate you and constantly dream about exterminating you until they get, finally get the opportunity, whether they be dreaming and plotting it for months or years, but as soon as they get that opportunity, they can't wait to exterminate you. You can't be looking over your shoulder like that every moment of every day if you're a criminal enslaver and think you can keep things rolling. You have to dispossess the people about their identity, and this is what the whites and offspring have always sought to do. So they started that process on the plantations. When some of our people got off the plantation, you have some of our people wage war against the whites in our spring and massacred them and freed ourselves from the plantation, such as in Dismal Swamp, in Virginia, North Carolina, where we were living intergenerationally. Thousands of people defending that independent, sovereign nation throughout enslavement to the end of enslavement for generations. There were some children who were living in the quote-unquote Dismal Swamp who were raised there intergenerationally, who had never seen a white person ever. This is right in the midst of enslavement. 1700s, 1800s, some of our people freed themselves. And there were other uh, independent maroon societies as well all over America when we escaped because we maintained our connection to our ancestral religious practices and we freed ourselves. There are some other individuals who didn't free themselves, but because of the work of the warriors and warrioresses, the Akunfo and Akunfo, the warriors and warrioresses who waged war against the whites and offspring, we forced the civil war, we forced the end of enslavement, we forced emancipation, we forced abolition, we forced repatriation initiatives and so forth. And so people who were on the plantation benefited from that war that we waged against the whites and offspring, and eventually they were free, they were emancipated because we forced that. Some individuals were still controlled by that self-hatred, so all it took was the whites and their offspring to come along and feed that self. They hated the fact that their skin was black or brown. They hated the fact that they had naturally coiled, curled hair. They hated the fact that they had natural lips and a natural nose and so forth. They wanted to have dead fur as hair, like the whites and their offspring, dead stringy fur, which is not real hair. Black people have hair. The whites and offspring have fur. Our people were brainwashed, so they wanted fur and thought their curls or coils were inferior because the whites and their offspring taught them that they were inferior, which is insane. But we embraced that because we were brainwashed. We thought that our melanin-dominant skin was inferior. In reality, the white melanin-recessive skin is inferior. The whites and offspring try to teach us that white skin is superior as a natural Evolution to a colder climate, it's not. It is a degeneration. It is inferior to black skin or brown skin. And we're talking about black or brown skin from Akurakani, Akurakani people only. Active melanin. You have other people who have quote unquote people of color who are not Akurakani, Akurakani, not African, not black. They may have some color, but they don't have active abatum or active melanin. They have inactive melanin or abatum. There's a reason we have abatum or melanin. Abatum is our con term to relate to melanin. The reason we have that in active because it is a conduit to the energy of ra and ra'et, yonkumpon and yonkumpon, udumare and oshumare, dai and yakwedo, the creator and creatress. Because we have that melanin and it is connected to the great kind kaya, the divinities who govern the black substance of space and the creator and creator can move through that black substance 
that possessed us and moved through us, it is active. It is receptive to the energy of the Abosa, the force of the nature. Those other so-called people of color, the whites and their offspring, Asians and so-called white Hispanics and so forth, who have a little tan skin, these are not Afrakani, Afrakani people. They have no connection to any force of the nature. Their melanin is therefore inactive. They cannot receive energy of Ra and Ra Ed or any divinity they cannot process or transmit. So it's meaningless for them. Our melanin is active, there's this inactive. And then you have melanin receptors who, who have little to no melanin. So, the white and spring tried to make us believe that our melanin, Abatun, was inferior in reality is superior. But when we're brainwashed, we want fur instead of hair. We want light skin, degenerate skin with extra vitiligo characteristics and albinoid characteristics. We want degenerate skin instead of melanin dominant skin. We want thinner lips instead of normal lips. We want thinner noses instead of normal noses. We want lighter eyes, degenerate, melanin-recessive eyes, as opposed to dark brown or black eyes and so forth. So when we're brainwashed like that, we seek to dispossess ourselves of our own identity. All the cracker has to do is come along and tell us, hey, you're not even black. Actually, you're Native American. And you have Negroes ever since enslaved and saying, well, I have Indian in my family. It's not because... Many, many of the people, a vast majority of our people, did not have Indian in the family. Very often what was happening was they were getting raped by the whites and their offspring, the European whites, and they had mulatto children, and they were light brown with straightish kind of hair, then they'd say, I have Indian in my family. And you have a small portion of people who have these pseudo-Native Americans, these migrant Asians in their family. And brainwashed Negroes are proud of that because, again, they want to be have close proximity to the racist, to the criminal. They want to look and feel like the criminal because they fear the criminal. So if they can merge with the criminal and think they can be the criminal, then they feel like they have some power. They can exercise some kind of influence and power over themselves. So they want to have close proximity to anyone with lighter skin, straighter hair, corrupted morphology, straighter noses and lips and so forth, corrupted bodies and all this other nonsense. So all the people have to say is, hey, you're not like your Native American, you have some in your family, they'll say one grandparent three or four generations away was quote-unquote Cherokee or some nonsense like that, and Negroes are running around talking about, I'm Cherokee. You have two parents, four grandparents, eight great-great-great-grandparents, eight 16 great-great, 32, 64, 128. You will go back a few generations, you're at 1,024. You have one rapist, blood in your one bloodline, one pseudo-Native American, one migrant Asian, because that one migrant Asian exists, you would dismiss the other 1,023 people and just say, I'm Cherokee, as opposed to the other 1,023 afro Afrikani people in your blood cell. That's insanity, and it's not based on anything real, because as we've shown in our broadcast, Bezra, reincarnation in Mota, Frafo, and the spirit of the mulatto, as well as the zebra, the ramifications of reincarnation. When you talk about identity, we're talking about what spirit entered into the womb. Was it an Afurakani ancestor, an ancestor who entered into the womb or not? That's what determines identity. So Negroes are seeking proximity to light skin and straight hair because they hate themselves. Then later on, you have Negroes who leave Christianity. They feel like Christianity was oppressing them. They understood that instinctively, but then they turned right around and embraced another white pseudo-religion and various iterations of these pseudo-religions. They embraced Islam or the idiocy of Moorishism, or they embraced some form of Hinduism or some pseudo-occultism or some pseudo-Masonic nonsense or some pseudo-atheistic nonsense or some pseudo-theosophical nonsense or idiocy. Spiritism, all these various things taking place in the late so called 1800s, early 1900s. And these little ridiculous groups popping up, and Negroes trying to tie themselves to Asia and saying they're Asiatic, the Asiatic black men, and all this idiot because they're worshiping whites from Arabia and Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and so forth. They hate themselves, they worship the whites in their offspring, they seek some proximity 
the light skin and straight hair, whether it's the white Arabs and so forth who are telling them, hey, you're a descendant from us. You come from Asia. You don't come from Africa. Those people are inferior. You come from us. You're our niggas. You don't come from the other niggas. You're our niggas. I mean, we get proud like, yes, master, we're your niggas. We're not from the other people. This is the idiocy that was being birthed and, and fashioned. You know, people start trying to force that nonsense and different iterations of it manifest, of course, the Nation of Islam promoting the idiocy of the Asiatic black man, pure stupidity. They're worshiping the white, homosexual, bisexual era, far, saying that's God, and they're getting down, 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 praying to this cracker, talking about that's God, and he had a white, God had a white mother, and our people are embracing this nonsense. So you have more science temple, and they're worshiping white Turks and so forth, slave-minded Negroes. Worshipping the whites and their offspring. If a white Arab tells you that Asia is superior and Africa is inferior, then you want to come from Asia. But then, of course, you know that you don't come from Asia. You know where you actually come from. So then you start trying to pretend like, well, actually, we're Native American. That's why we want to have that proximity to light skin, straight hair, and these Native Americans walking around here. Actually, those are our people. And we're descended from them, and we don't really have any African blood. Some of the Africans polluted our blood circle, and that's why we're a little bit dark and our lips look a little bit different, but actually we're really descended from the Native Americans. Sometimes they would try to say that and those Native Americans came from Israel and they were part of the Hebrew tribes, which is idiotic. There were no ancient Hebrews in existence at all of any race whatsoever. But some of these Negroes started to move in the direction of saying, well, we actually came up out of the ground in the Western Hemisphere and we were never in Africa. Or we came up out of the ground in Asia and we were never in Africa. This is all idiocy. It's all based on self-hatred. So anybody who began to promote that nonsense, it was either through ignorance and rooted in their own self-hatred, or they were working on behalf of the whites and their offspring. And many of them were. Many of them still are today. So you have these fools who refer to themselves foolishly as more as well as various other titles, trying to gain a resurgence of the same idiotic practice that goes back to the late so-called 1800s, early 1900s putting for a great deal of false information because deep down inside, they hate themselves. They know that what they're saying is inaccurate. Every one of them who puts forth this notion that African Americans aren't African, every one of them knows that that's a lie. But they continue to lie. The ones who are ignorant do it because they hate themselves and they don't want to face the reality that they hate themselves. They want to pretend as though they have self-love, but they recoil from the idea that they come from Afuraka, Afuraka to Africa because they've been conditioned against that and they hate it. And they have a deep-seated desire to copulate with light-skinned, straight-haired individuals. And they want to have close proximity to them because they feel that they are inferior, the light-skinned, straight-haired individuals are superior, and they want some connection with them, even to the extent that they will lie about their own blood circle and lineage to have some kind of manufactured proximity to those people they think they're superior. That makes them feel a little bit better about themselves. And the more militant they are with this notion of we're not African, the more self-hating on the inside they actually are. That's the reality. This is what enslavement did to the spirit and the minds of our people, and it's been passed down intergenerations. When people were tortured and so forth, and didn't do well under that torture and lost that connection consciously with the Ussimah for their own cross, then they start operating in a self-destructive, mentally discordant fashion. And when those kind of people make their transition, they're still spirits that are disturbed. They're still traumatized. They're still suffering. They're still transient, still angry and anxious, lashing out and influencing people in a negative way. And you have those kind of negative, anxious, suffering kind of ancestral spirits who are earthbound, still impacting their living descendants. So all it takes is somebody to be raised in white culture, brainwashed to believe that black is inferior and so forth, even if they become a little bit Afrocentric or Pan-African and talking about RBG and so forth, and red, black, and green, all these different things. But deep down inside, they still have that self-hatred and manifest in a couple of ways. They'll talk all of the black stuff, but then on the low, every time you see who they're looking at or running at or pursuing and so forth, they're always promoting some light-skinned, straight-haired individual, whether it's a male or female. They're 
talking about black women, mother of civilization. It's always a light-skinned woman with straight hair. They look like a stripper, but they have on red, black, and green bikini, and they say, well, this is the black mother of civilization. They're always going back to worshiping that white image deep down inside. Whatever's deep down inside, it manifests its surfaces. They can't hide it. That's, that's one iteration of that. Then you have other ones who decide they want to reject the whole pan-African, quote-unquote, secular nationalist paradigm and go to, well, we're just aboriginal. We come from here. We don't come from Africa because they are, that allows them, once again, to realign with light-skinned, straight hair people. They can talk all they want about darkness, and some of them don't want to use the term black because they don't know where the term comes from. They've been misinformed by idiots like Moors and others with their pseudo-etymology. We just did the broadcast, the origins of the term black, the etymological and cosmological origins of the term black, which is rooted directly in ancient Hanif and Kemet. We proved that irrefutably. And the same thing with the term Africa, we wrote the book on that, literally, which is irrefutable. So these terms come directly from our language. They don't understand that, and they're not seeking to understand that because they're still controlled by self-hatred, so they're still seeking proximity. So they will manufacture a whole pseudo-cosmology to make themselves rooted and born, raised up and coming out of the ground in the Western Hemisphere and have never been to the continent before, all in an attempt to fraudulently remove themselves from their own metric plans and patrick plans to have close proximity to the whites and their offspring and that whole program was created by the whites in their offspring during enslavement to dispossess us of our identity. And these fools are running around trying to recast and remix truth story or history to make it fit this idiotic agenda. Our people, many of our people, are literally mentally ill, spiritually discord. And we did a broadcast dealing with cartoon scholars and animaniacs and animaniacs, but we were also talking about behavioral illness, mental illness, spiritual discord within our community, sometimes being passed off to people who are passing themselves off as normal individuals and they are spiritually discord. So spiritual disalignment um, manifestations in the European context would be called schizophrenia, bipolar, major depressive disorder, various anxiety disorders and so forth, access one diagnoses in the DSM. But in our culture, we would call them odinfo, mentally or spiritually disaligned, disaligned from their okra. Of course, within our culture, we have the capacity to realign with our okra. It's not just through therapy, through ritual practice, through adebisa, divination, and so forth. We engage that process. We did a broadcast on uh, psychology versus ancestral religion. We call it therapists for the racist because therapist spells out the racist. So when you're dealing with ancestral religion, and quote-unquote therapy, ritual practice is totally different from Eurocentric psychology or pseudo-Afrocentric psychology, which is just Eurocentric psychology and black faith. So many of our people are manifesting spiritual discordance, which is really mental illness, and they're posting a lot of things and writing books and making videos and making documentaries and everything else. These are people who are undiagnosed, but they're mentally discordant spiritually discordant, spiritually disaligned, mentally ill, self-destructive, delusion, and they're promoting themselves as normal, and some people are listening to that. So when you understand the reality and the history behind and the foundation of this behavior and these ideas and this desire, which is rooted in self-hatred that was forced on us by our enemies, then everything they have to say is easily dismissed. But it also can be dismissed with just factual information, even before you just dismiss them because you know they're spiritually discordant and self-hating and trying to cloak their self-hatred in some kind of pride of being from, you know, uh, the Western Hemisphere, which is idiotic. Um, you can just deal with factual information that knock down every single thing they've ever put forward. So we can start from where we are right now and then work our way back. When people try to say we don't come from Afraka, Afraka, we don't come from Africa, of course, origin of the term Africa, we prove that in our book, Afraka, Afraka, the origin of the term Africa. In our book, Kemet, Kenat, Ntoro, the black nation and divinity, we talk about the term Kemet, show its cosmological and etymological origin, 
and we show the exact same term, talking about the black people, talking about their black skin, as well as connected to the divinity, the black divinity, and so forth. We also show the exact same term in the Akan language with the same cosmology, with the same deities, and so forth, representing the same people and also black people containing the fire within. So we go into detail about that with the first number one to publish and prove that Akuraka Afraka is the origin of the term Africa, showing it intimate due to the hieroglyphs which no scholars, black or white, have ever shown until we published. In Kemet, Hina Ntoro, we prove the origin cosmologically and etymologically of the term Kemet, as well as Ntoro, misnomered Netzer, and we're the first to show and prove where these terms come from, the cosmology that birthed them, as well as the symbolism, including the act for the term Ntoro, Netzer, or deity. We show that act, why it is an act, what does it represent, and show that the exact same act exists in the Akan language representing a deity, in the Hoodoo tradition as well, representing a deity. So we show that as well, and then we just release that uh, broadcast where we publish that information, the origin of the term black, rooted in our ancestral cosmology and language. It has no root in European languages. It's not rooted in the European or Proto-Indo-European language Father, We proved that last night in the broadcast. You can download that broadcast. That will be part of an upcoming book. We're going to talk about everything we address in the broadcast with uh, great detail as well as more information that we weren't able to fit into the broadcast. The broadcast was just a summary. The broadcast proved the origin of the term black etymologically and cosmologically, but it was just a summary. All of that information will be in the publication in detail with additional information that we were not able to fit in. So that information you can knock it right out the box. We know that Akuraka Afraka is the origin, black is the origin, and so forth. And etymologically, cosmologically, linguistically, that's all laid out. There's nothing anybody can say to refute that. All they've been doing is talking and putting forth silly theories. We have actual proof, and it's printed, and it can be studied and verified. And people have already done that. Now, when it comes to where do we come from, Cosmologically, within our culture, if you look at Akurakani Afrakani people, if you start from here, and then we're going to work our way back to the continent, contemporary, and then we're going to work our way back to the continent, ancient times, and we're going to talk about some DNA as well. If you look at our culture here, where do we come? Do we come from Akuraka, Afraka, Africa, or do we come from the Western Hemisphere? Are we quote unquote Aboriginal? Every Akurakani Afrakani person on earth, every black person on earth is descendant from Akurakani Afrakani people who originated on the continent. Our people originated on the mother continent. And then we migrated all around the world. That's true historical, that's reality. That's part of our culture, that's part of our true streets, that's part of our cosmology. And then, of course, later on, when archaeology Archaeology is done in anthropological studies as well as linguistic as well as uh, genetic. Of course, those different fields bear out what our cosmology and our truth have said because we know where we are. You know where you were sitting yesterday. You know what you were doing 10 years ago and what city you were in, what place you were walking around in. Our people know where we came from, where we have been for thousands of years. We know that we didn't originate in the Western Hemisphere. That's ridiculous. So our people have known that from the beginning. Now, if you look at where we are right now, in the Kudu tradition, as well as Juju and Bodun and so forth in North America, we communicate with our ancestors as an ancestor. We don't just pour libation in some symbolic ritual. We communicate with our ancestresses and ancestors. They speak directly to us. They show themselves to us, to adults as well as children. They speak directly to us, not just in dreams, but also in real time. They possess our people in speak. A portion of them who are recently departed, they spoke English while they were here. That's the language they understood. They still can speak that language now. But the majority of our ancestors and ancestors don't speak English. So when they possess, when they communicate, they speak in their ancestral language. So when they communicate with us in the Akan language, even before we knew anything about Akan language or Akan people, they communicated with us in the Akan language and showed us 
what these terms mean in the Akan language. They directed us to go study Akan language to verify what we were given. And so we had to go and study the Akan language to find out that the words and terms that they told us were Akan terms and they had the exact same meaning that they gave to us prior to us knowing anything about the Akan language. They show us exactly where they come from on the continent. So we deal directly with our people. For example, if you were if you were staying with a family on the continent for a week or two and you didn't speak the language and they didn't speak English, if, they, if you saw a dog walk by and they pointed at the dog and said "cramine" and pointed and said "cramine" and then urged you to say "cramine" and you re- repeated "cramine," then you know that the word for dog in Akan is "cramine." If you saw a bird flying, they pointed to the bird and said "anuma." And it urged you to repeat that, and you said anuma. So every time you see a bird, they say anuma, then you know the word for bird is anuma. If you point at the eye and said any, and had you repeat it, and you said any, now you know that's the word for eye. You say quini for nose, quini for nose, or auto for mouth, and so forth. They start teaching you language. They point it out and they share it with you. And you're learning the language. You're not teaching them English, they're teaching you. They're pointing out things, showing you things, and giving you the names for those things, giving you the names for certain activities and so forth. When the Utsumapo come during ritual, they do the exact same thing. They point things out, show you things, or they show you what's going on in the room, in the place, or they show you things spiritually that have taken place in your life, and they identify them in the language. You remember those terms, and now you've learned terms to identify certain thoughts, actions, behaviors, entities, and so forth. You're learning directly from them then, of course, you can go after you learn from them and go look up the language or come in contact with somebody who speaks the language fluently and say, hey, does this word mean this or what does this word mean? And they will verify everything you said. Your people are communicating directly with you. So we have to recognize of our ancestors as an ancestor. We don't have to rely on a theory given by the White and offspring. We communicate. We're, we're real about ancestry then. We're not just some Negroes talking about something abstract. Like the deities are just principles and laws that represent different aspects of creation. That's pure stupidity. That's white atheistic nonsense. There are many gods and goddesses. There are real living, conscious, male and female reasoning entities, beings that we communicate directly with. We are the children of the Abosom, the Arisha, the Vodou, the Umtoru, Umtoru, too. We worship many, many gods and goddesses. We are polytheists. In the real sense, Negroes are scared of the term because white people made them scared of the term. Monotheism is, in theory, is pure stupidity. Only a fool would embrace the idiocy of monotheism because it's not real. There's always been amen and aminette. And the various children and grandchildren of amen and aminette that we invoke, that we worship, that we communicate with. So we communicate directly with the ancestors and ancestors. We know exactly who our people are. And they know exactly where they came from. And they will show you the village where they came from. We communicate with Asaseyafua, the fertile earth mother, and Asaseya, that barren but strong, stern earth mother. They're called Onile and Yewa in the Yoruba tradition. Same male, two female earth mother divinities. We communicate directly with her. We ask her and communicate with her just like we ask and communicate with the other Abosom that govern different aspects of creation. We find out directly from her not only how to procure medicine from her, the kind of foods we should stay away from since we're living in this region where we first were forced over here, what plant life is good for us, what plant life is, what mineral life is good for us, what mineral life is. We learn that directly from the Abosom, directly from the Earth Mother the spirits of the Abosom that govern those different classes of plant life and mineral life. We didn't have to learn that from some pseudo-Native American. We learned that directly from the Abosom, just like George Washington Carver. He didn't go learn something from some pseudo-migrant Asian masquerading as a Native American. He learned directly from plant life, communicated with the spirits of plants, as he reported himself. And then he would go in the laboratory and innovate and replicate what he learned from the spirits that animate plant life and created hundreds of products from peanuts, sweet potatoes, and so forth and transformed the world. And, of course, one of our presenters, Tama Asase Aje, who presented at the Kuduman Festival, she engages the same process, and this is how she makes her tinctures and her medicines, 
from plant life and mineral life by communicating with the spirits that govern plant life and mineral life and the Abosom that govern her, her and her clan and the Usumapu that govern her and her clan. She didn't learn that from some pseudo-Native American or some black person claiming to be a Native American and so forth or claiming that they never came from Africa. She's communicating directly with plant life, mineral life, and create tinctures that have healed many, many people over the years. So we communicate directly with the earth mother. We learn directly from her. We learn directly from the Abosa. And they show us specifically that we come from Asuraka, Asuraka. And they will tell us about the Abosa and how they manifest there and how the difference between how they manifest there. We know exactly where we come from. So we're not dependent on anyone outside of our blood circle trying to tell us where we come from. It's some fool who's engaged in self-hatred who wants to have in, on the down low, low-key, want to still connect with the whites in their offspring or lay up with some light-skinned, straight-haired Asians, pretending that they're proud and deep inside that's all they really want because they hate themselves. You don't need to listen to Negroes like that who are mentally ill, spiritually discordant. We know exactly where we come from. So we learned that specifically from our people, we have maintained our ancestral connection. We communicate directly with our ancestors as an ancestor. We also have our own spirit, our own sun sun, and our own ka, kawa, soul, divine consciousness that governs our head. And we have a divine consciousness that governs the head, the deity that dwells in the head region, called the ka, or, or kawa and akan, ka and guide and ancient command the Ori Inu in the Yoruba tradition and so forth, the Satan Ido and Vodun, the Chi and Ibo, the deity that dwells in the head region, that's the spirit's brain, just like within your physical brain and in your spirit brain, you can remember what took place when you were six years old and five years old and where you were at and what you were doing. All of that is encoded within your brain, within your memory. But that's not the only thing that's encoded in your memory. Of course, some things are suppressed. You may think may have happened when you were five or six that you don't, can't think about right now, but when something happens, it triggers a memory that just shows it was always there. Nothing is erased. Everything is within that memory. But it's not just recent activity. Every aspect of your existence is encoded within your spirit brain. Every previous lifetime is encoded within your spirit brain. So where you have lived in the past, where you came from thousands of years ago, Every incarnation is encoded within your spirit brain, your spirit's memory. So you have a direct ancestral memory, not only living here at this particular time or previous lifetime, living during the enslavement era. We have ancestral memories of living on the continent. And once we connect with people or learn about specific things, we can tell them about a specific thing or some happening that we should not, quote, unquote, know about because we haven't been there, but we've been there. Or the Usumapu or our own ancestral memory would show us a specific village where specific shrines are that nobody has taken any cameras to. And then once we arrive there, it's exactly as we have been shown, first time we've ever been on the continent. Because we lived there in a previous lifetime as part of a group and spoke that language and so forth. So we have an ancestral memory of having lived on the continent as part of a specific group. No idiot, no behaviorally unstable and emotionally unstable clown who wants proximity to the white snail spring, the light-skinned, straight-haired individuals who want to pretend like they don't come from Afraka, Afraka. We don't have to depend on fools like that to try to convince us that we didn't come from and have that direct memory. It's like a fool trying to convince you that if you were at work yesterday, they're going to try to prove to you and do a debate with you and say, well, I can prove that you weren't at work yesterday. You didn't, you didn't come out that building yesterday. You were in China yesterday. I can prove it. I got the evidence right here. Let me show you a slide presentation to prove that you were in China yesterday. Nigga, shut up. These, these are idiots, clowns, self-hating fools. We're not depending on these fools for our identity, our ancestral memory. Nobody can take that from you. Our direct connection with the Usamanto, our ancestors and ancestors who are from Afuraka, they know exactly where they're from. Nobody can take that information from you. But then we can go even further. That's our own direct experience, our, our connection with Asaseyapu, the fertile earth mother, and Asaseya, the stern earth mother. We learn directly from them. 
why we have to interface with them based on our new condition in this region, how we have to interface with them because we didn't originate in this region, and they will show us that. They've already shown us that. That's why we have to interface with them differently because we don't come from here. We have to learn how to acclimate here and bind ourselves to this region by interfacing with Asafiyaku and Asafiya in this region in a different manner because we don't come from this region originally. That's us here. But then you have people on the continent, of course, who still live there and part of the cosmology and culture and truth to it. In our Khan culture, in the Wenchi tradition, Wenchi area, where the Asona people are and so forth and other groups, they can take you to the specific spot in the region of Akwini Koko, where their ancestors and ancestors, their first Nsamako, came up out of the ground at the beginning of creation. And they can show you the spot and show you the region and show you where the river is. And this has been part of the culture for thousands of years. They know exactly where their people came up out of the ground. That's not a theory from a cracker. That's part of the ancestral religion. And they have specific rituals they do in those regions because that's where their Utsumanko first emerged at the beginning of creation after Odomankuma finished fashioning and concretizing the earth. Odomankuma and Akan is Apunukopa and then you commit Asim Kepra, and then Otomankoma in connection with Asase, Afua, that's Otomankoma and Asase, the male divinity and female divinity. Then you have Atumukopa and Asase, Nebede Tepet, and then you commit the same two days. Atumukopa and Asase who give birth to Shu and Tepnu, and Shu and Tepnu give birth to Gerenu. Atumukopa, Asim Kepra, and Asase, Nebede Tepet, and then you commit Otomankoma and Asase. In our time. And after Utumankoma concretizes that aspect of the fertile earth in connection with Asase, then the people came up out of the ground and they said, Yes, three, we are from here. We are Aboriginal here. This is where we are from. And they call themselves Yes, three people because we, Yes, three, from this region. This is where we're from. This is where we come from. The same thing with the Yoruba tradition. Same thing with the Bodun tradition and so forth. Every tradition on the continent, all over the continent, they'll talk about specific regions of the continent. And usually if you, if you compile all of them, the people in South Afrika, Afrika, many of them have traditions of coming from a little bit further north of where they are right now. The people in North Afrika, Afrika, have traditions of coming from a little bit further south and where they are right now, they migrated north. Where the people in the south migrated south. The people in the west will tell you they migrated from the east. The people in the extreme east will tell you they migrated a little bit from the west. And we all have these different things. Now, we just want to say before we go forward, there's only 90 seconds left in the online version of the broadcast. If you want to listen beyond 11 o'clock, then you must call in so you can get on the phone line to listen beyond 11 o'clock. It's calling number 657-383-0635, 657-383-0635. You have about a minute to call in because then in a minute, the online portion will cut off. You won't be able to hear anything, but the people who are on the phone, then you'll still be able to hear beyond 11 o'clock. So you've got about now about 45 seconds to call in. And we won't go too much longer beyond 11 o'clock, but 45 seconds, uh, 657-383-0635. 657-383-0635. So we have people on the continent, of course, when you look at the different traditions, it moves towards the central portion. Before there was a Sahara Desert, that desertification process takes place every 2,000 years. It used to be an aquatic region, a very fertile region and so forth. So when you look at the different traditions, they all begin to merge towards that aquatic region, that fertile region where people originated and then moved away from that region in different directions. So all over the continent, every group you find will talk about the region of the continent that they came from and they came up out of the ground from. No group on the continent will tell anybody that they came from Asia or anywhere else unless the whites and their offspring have been talking to these people and trying to 
impute some ridiculous thing like aliens and all this other nonsense. So our people in our cosmology connected to these divinities, these forces in nature, their ancestral culture, history, identity, to tell you exactly where they come from. We know where we come from over here because we still communicate with the ancestors and ancestors and the divinities, and they show and prove to us where we came from, which is Ahura Ka, Ahura Ka, and our connection to Ahura and Ahuraya, the creator and creator. People on the continent who still live there, they still have traditions and can take you specifically to the region where their people came up out of the ground and still have shrines there right now. And that's an old tradition. But when you look in the language and you look in the culture and you see these traditions, well, did these traditions arise just a few hundred years ago when some crackers came and, and the crackers fed all the black people around the continent a theory about them coming from Africa, but in reality they came from Asia somewhere else? That's just stupidity. But we can prove that these different cosmologies that all are very similar are not recent because when you look in the culture of ancient Kamek and Kanat, you have the exact same cosmology. And we can prove it because we have the exact same words and deities and names of deities in the contemporary Akurakani, Akurakani languages today that you find in the Medusa. We can translate the Medusa with the languages that we speak today because it's the same language. We can prove that, and the white and offspring could not engage that process. When we prove that the Akan language is directly descended of ancient Kani and Kamet, no white scholar has ever done that kind of work. We've proven that. Nobody else has done that. We've shown that these deities that govern the seven days of the week and the various other divinities in the Akan tradition are the exact same deities with the exact same names, with the exact same functions in creation, and so forth. We've shown that Ra and Raya and Atem and Chakra and Asate Nebedet Hebed and Asate Nebedet and Asar and Aset and Set and Nebedet and Heru, Heru Behudet, Het Heru, Shu, Tefnu, Amen, Amenet, Hehu, Hehu, Kai and Kaiet, Nun and Nunet, all these different divinities exist in the Akan language by the same names, with the same function, exactly as they're laid out in the Medusu and Ancient Kemet, and the same words and titles and so forth. So we can prove that, and we can properly decipher these texts because we are part of a living culture. So when you look in the text, they have the exact same cosmology about the creation of the world, talking about the primordial mound rising up, and they're telling you exactly where that primordial mound is. In the parts of Ani, for example, the papyrus of uh, Kunefe, talking about the mound that rules up in Kemenu, the place that was later called Kemenu, the white and offspring will later call it Hermaphrodite, that is in Akuraka, Akuraika. They will talk about men and women coming from the eyes, the teardrop of Ra, the eye of Ra, the right eye of Ra is the sun, the left eye of Ra is the moon. That solar energy falling from the Oriya, from the sun, becomes that little, that drop of solar energy becomes our Ba, or our Ba'at, our divine living energy. We are fashioned from that primordial mouth at the beginning of creation. We talked about in the, the broadcast on blacks, the etymological and cosmological origin. We talked about the Bin Bin stone, the Bini Bini stone, and so forth, that primordial mound that the Binu bird a light upon in the same fashion that the sun sets in the west and inside the red setting sun is our sun. He alights upon the primordial mound and so forth, and that solar energy penetrates that original black mound, and that fiery energy cooks or burns and concretizes that mound that rolls up out of the water and hardens it, ossifies it, concretizes it, and now our bodies of the first human beings are fashioned from that primordial black now, and then, of course, our people begin to migrate all over the continent and then migrate into different parts of the world. All of that cosmology is laid out in the text of Kemet before the white and offspring exist in the world. And then you look at the contemporary Akurakani, Akurakani cultures today, and they have the exact same cosmology all over the continent with the same dead, with the same function. Then you get into the Hudu tradition, Juju, Vodu, Gregory, Wanga, and Gengan, and so forth. In North America, we have the same cosmology, the same understanding. Even before we went in to study and read about 
the cosmologies and different people on the continent, our Utsumapa already showed us, Asasiya Fua and Asasiya already showed us that we didn't originate in this region of her body. We originated on the continent. They already showed us where on the continent we came from and showed us the village and so forth. And then you have some little silly clown who wants to be white or wants to have light skin and straight hair or lay up to somebody with light skin and straight hair trying to tell you you come from America. Our people migrated to the Western Hemisphere just like we migrated to Asia and migrated to Southern Europe before the whites and offspring existed. We migrated to North, Central, and South America thousands of years ago in the Caribbean before the whites and offspring existed. And we existed in these places for thousands of years. When you look in Asia, you look, for example, in Southern Asia, the original Apurakaniafrakaiti people of Southern Asia that original type still exists. Yes, the white canal spring began to invade from north, the northern region down to, into southern Asia for the Indian subcontinent and so forth. But when you look at the Andaman Islands, Andamanese, so, so called, and the Sentinel, Sentinelese and so forth, you see that jet black people with full lips, full noses, tightly coiled hair. They look just like anybody from Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, Africa, and so forth. That's the original type that's still there, and they, they isolated themselves from the larger population, and they still fight and shoot arrows at planes and helicopters when they come, even just to show up and wave and say hi. They start shooting at them because they know what the crackers are doing. That's why they were able to maintain their culture in the same pristine, the whites and offspring are called a primitive, but pristine or primal state for thousands of years. And they're still living the same way as hunter-gatherers and so forth, as well as um, doing some agriculture and so forth that they've been living for thousands of years. So those are the original type, and they're still there. But then the further north you get, the lighter the people become. Then you have people with light brown, and they have straighter hair and so forth. Some are dark brown with straighter hair. That's because of miscegenation. It's not because originally some of our people had straight hair and some people did. Negroes want to believe that some of our people originally had straight hair because they still, deep down inside, want to have proximity to the light-skinned, straight-haired individual. So they promote this idea that, oh, well, there's the Eastern Ethiopians that have straight hair and the Western did. But, of course, that's idiotic. And then, of course, when DNA studies have been done, it's only been a 1,000 years that the people in that region, because of miscegenation, developed that straight hair because of great pollution from the white snarl spring. Prior to that, none of those people had straight hair. So that's a recent phenomenon. They've been there for over 60,000 years. And the ones who are still pristine, like the Andamanese and the Sentinelese, they don't have straight hair at all. So our people migrated to these areas, but when the whites and the offspring invaded, and they are in the north and so forth, they started taking over the north over thousands of years. And one of the main reasons why they were able to take over is because of their diseases that precedes them, the epidemics that precedes them. It wasn't that they were so militarily powerful as their disease, wiping people out, epidemics and so forth. So you have that southern Asia. This is why even though you have originally black people in southern Asia, the whites and their offspring developed in northern Europe after the end of the last ice age, they began to migrate into northern Eurasia and so forth. They come in contact with the blacks who have been there from the beginning. Their diseases come with them. Over time, it's the diseases that take people out, primarily. Of course, they're waging war as well. But the diseases, the plagues and so forth, that are taking people out over the course of thousands of years. So you start off having Asia being a black, quote-unquote, continent, southern Asia. The white and the come thousands of years later. Look at today. If you look at China, originally, the original population of China and southern China is black people. If you look at China now, nearly 1.5 billion people, the vast majority of them, pale, melanin recessive type Asian. They're not, it's not, China's not dominated by the black population. It used to be dominated by the black population, but the black population is almost um, extinct in China. You have some, but they're almost extinct because the white you know, parasites have taken over. The exact same thing took place in the Western Hemisphere. 
Yes, we came over here thousands of years ago. We built pyramids exactly like the pyramids we built in ancient Kemet with the same coordinates and so forth. And then when you look at the actual sculptures and everything else, you'll find the same cosmology that you find in ancient Kemet, even the same dress, the head dresses, the same ritual uh, gestures and so forth. These were people from ancient Kanat and Kemet who came over here and built the pyramids. It wasn't people who originated here and just manufactured pyramids on their own. First, the whites and their offspring trying to pretend that they were the ones who built the pyramids. Then brainwashing Negroes who want to be white will latch on and say they were those original white individuals, and then they want to say that they built the pyramids and they were aboriginal, and in fact, the pyramids over here are older than the ones on the continent, and the original pyramids were here. Pure stupidity. Some silly Negroes running around trying to relocate themselves in another hemisphere because they hate themselves so much. Pure stupidity. And has no basis in reality. You can't prove a syllable of what they're saying. It's clown nonsense. So our people migrate over here, build pyramids and so forth. We're living here. Asians begin to invade. The whites and their offspring from Asia. The perverts, the deviants. These are not Native Americans. They are migrants from Asia, criminal invaders from Asia. The light-skinned, straight-haired, criminal invaders. They get over here. They wage war against our people. They come over there. They're the Eastern Eurasian. The Western Eurasian, oh, they're coming from Siberia and other places. The Eastern, the Western Eurasians are the Europeans, and they come over from the other side. So you have Western Eurasians coming on one side. You have Eastern Eurasians coming from the other side. Our people are already here. Once again, it wasn't that the whites and offspring were so military powerful, militarily prow- powerful, or had such great military prowess that they were able to defeat our people in a few hundred years. It was the diseases, just like the Black Plague decimated Europe. Between one-third and one-half of the entire population of Europe was wiped out in five years. That is akin, if you can imagine, because most people can't imagine that kind of devastation. There's over 330 million people in the United States. If you can imagine 165 million people dropping dead within the next five years. Bodies, tens of thousands of bodies piling up in the street every day. When you go to work and you see six to 7,000 bodies laid out on the street downtown, uh, decomposing. That's what was happening in, in Europe. And the people who are eyewitnesses writing about bodies piled up, rats running around the bodies, dead bodies everywhere, people falling out, boils all over their bodies and so forth. This is what was happening with the plague. The key is that the same plague hit North, Central, South America, and the Caribbean. Carib and the Ottawaks and so forth, they were almost entirely wiped out by the plague and including the Hanta virus in the Western Hemisphere. It was wiped and offspring about smallpox as well as measles and mumps and typhoid fever and everything else and cholera, diseases, multiple diseases that didn't exist over here before. But then that Hanta virus as well, that smallpox is a major one, These, as well as the plague. So these plagues hit, it is estimated between 90 and 95% of the entire population over here in the West was wiped out by these plagues. Now, the whites and offspring will wage war. They're going to pretend like, oh, they were so powerful that they were just stomping everybody on the way in there, conquistadors as well as the other Europeans were coming in and just enslaving people and snatching people up and everything else. After a whole village of people is decimated, people laid out dying with boils and everything else, then the crackers come in and set it on fire and shoot and stab the people and everything else and steal everything. This is what mainly was going on. Their disease was perceived. They bring their domesticated animals, their carriers of disease. Those animals go forward, polluting the water and so forth. The whole village is drinking the water. They get polluted. Things are passing, you know, viruses are passing around and so forth. The people are, are dying at record numbers. That's the real reason it was depopulated. It wasn't because of their power, military. So, you have millions of people being wiped out. This is the reason why, just like in Asia, originally, 
it was a black population. Today, try to find a black population in China. The vast majority of people in China are Asian. Exactly the same thing that happened here originally is the black population. Now, the vast majority of the people, after enslavement and so forth, were the original blacks, as well as some of the Asians who came a little, the Eastern Asians who came a little bit before the Western Eurasians. The Eastern Eurasians bringing their diseases. The Western Eurasians bringing their diseases. First, the Eastern Eurasians coming over and invading before the Western Asians get there. This is in, you know, over a thousand years ago, a couple of thousand years ago. Then Chinese people coming over here, Siberians and so forth, they're coming over, but they're bringing their diseases. They're also waging war against our people. Those diseases begin to depopulate the original black population. That's a couple of thousand years ago. So the Asian population is increasing, while the original black population is decreasing. And the key is the Asians keep coming over here. They keep migrating over here. They didn't just come once and just sit. They keep migrating. They keep sailing over here. They keep having new immigrants. When our people were over here, we weren't constantly in the, quote, unquote, 300s, 400s, 800s, 700s AD and so-called AD. We weren't constantly sailing over here and constantly populating North, Central, and South America. Our people had come in earlier times. There were a few voyages after that, but we were not constantly immigrating over here. There were populations here, and, and we were just here. The Asians kept coming. Our population was being diminished by disease as well as warfare, but we weren't being replenished by new immigration from Akuraka, Akuraka. We were being decimated in that regard. But then when the uh, Western Eurasians came with their diseases, with the plague, as well as smallpox and mumps and everything else, as well as waging war, that's what really was the death nail for the original black population that was left over. They had already been suffering from the diseases and depopulation from the Eastern Eurasian and their filthy diseases hundreds of years before the Western Eurasians. But once the Western Eurasians showed up, so-called 1400s and into the early 1500s, so-called 1500s, really 12,500s and so-called 1500s, with Cortez and all these other people, and those diseases are really, that's when the epidemics really pick up. You need to study the depopulation of ancient America, the plague of ancient America, and see how we were decimated. And once those populations were decimated through plague, and then the Asians waging war against our people, as well as the Europeans waging war against our people, then you have those small populations of black people in South America, maroon style in South America. You have small populations in different parts of Mexico and so forth. You have some small populations in the Caribbean, but most of them were wiped out. You have some small populations further deep down, like in Peru and stuff like that. But the vast majority of people in, in the Caribbean, parts of Central America, and, of course, North America, wiped out. So then the whites and the offspring decide we need to begin to bring Afurakani, Afurakani people from the continent and force them over here because they're stronger, they're, they're rice growers any way, they have all kinds of skills and so forth. They can build this economy that we want to have built. And these little Asians, they're dying in the rice fields and everything else, they can't hold up. So they start bringing our people, and plus we had a strong immune system and so forth because after our interfacing with the cracker, because the Europeans already started going to the continent, they start bringing their diseases to the continent, but we started developing immunity and so forth. We started trading with the European, which we should not have been doing, uh, in the so-called 1400s and 1500s and so forth. And they start realizing that, hey, these people, can, they are on the rice coast now, the grain coast and all this other stuff, the grow coast. They can come over here and work these, these fields. They can be in the fields for hours and hours at a time and so forth and all this other stuff. So they began to bring our people over here after the diseases depopulated this region. This is where the original black population was decimated from disease primarily, but then secondarily the waging war by the eastern Eurasians and western Eurasians. That's what decimated that population. Then our people were forced over here during the um, Musua Ketsi of the Great Conversion to the enslaved era. And so this is how we ended up in North America, as well as Central America, South America, and the Caribbean, and so forth. And this is why we have that direct ancestral link to Akuraka, Akuraka.
what I thought. Ancestrally, culturally, spiritually, we have a direct understanding because we interface with the actual ancestors and ancestors who were first forced over here. They show us when they were in the boats, and some of us remember being in those boats. And some idiot's going to try to tell you that you weren't in that situation because they want to be in alignment with some straight-haired, light-skinned cracker because deep down inside, they've always hated themselves. But what they need to do is come out of their self-hatred. And what we do is dismiss them and their silly clown arguments because we have real information, information that we publish, information that other people have published that prove these things in detail. That includes DNA studies, which simply corroborate everything we already know, but simply knock all those silly arguments out of the box. Now, just like our people praise individuals like Dr. Henry Sampson, because, because of his gamma cell innovation, we have cell phones and smartphones today. That brother was responsible for that. You have Dr. Mark Dean. Because of his patents with IBM, we have personal computers. If it wasn't for him, there would be no personal computer, no PC, no laptop and all of that. So you have Dr. Henry Sampson dealing with smartphones, the origin, his innovations led to cell phones and then later smartphones. Dr. Mark Dean with patents that led to this PC, the personal computer. You have Dr. Sandeep, our brothers from here. But then you have Dr. Philip Eniagwali, who is from Nigeria. So he teaches here, the father of the Internet, because of his innovation in showing computers how to speak to one another, we have the Internet. So these three technological advances which govern everything that's happening in the world today. Everything that's happening in the world is all the technological advances that move the world forward. Smartphones, computers, and the Internet in combination has transformed the world. And these three brothers are the root of those three different aspects of technology that has transformed the world and moved the world forward with regard to all kinds of innovations in business, whether it's uh, innovations in medicine, innovations in space technology, innovations in engineering, civil and mechanical and whatever it is, all based on what our people have done. And we, we're proud of these, these innovations because it helps to transform our own lives. And we can communicate with another, one another back and forth across the world, across the country, across the continent, wherever our people exist, because of the innovations of our people. There's another innovator that many of our people don't know about. That's Dr. Herman Branson, who we talked about before. It's because of his uh, capacity to map out the heliacal structure of protein, that led to the discovery of the double helix DNA and all of the DNA studies that come forward, including the Human Genome Project, is rooted in what Dr. Herman Branson did with the discovery of that alpha helix. We think about DNA and the heliacal structure of DNA. If it wasn't for Dr. Herman Branson, nobody would know about that heliacal structure. And then that double helix wouldn't have been found out, and then we wouldn't have learned about the Human Genome Project. So, or that wouldn't have developed. We've had these individuals all along the way who don't get credit for anything. Life and offspring takes credit for everything. Scientists who were working along with Herman Branson, once he made his discovery, they were given the Nobel uh, Prize, and he was left out. He was snubbed. But he was the one who did the work. So our people don't get credit. We mentioned that because when we start talking about DNA studies, we're not just talking about the black uh, scientists and geneticists today who are actually on the ground doing the work and studying these structures and putting this information out, including like AfricanAncestry.com and so forth, out of our university, those the black geneticists there, with black geneticists all around this country and around the world who are doing this work day in and day out, these people who are studying the helical structures and so forth, matching up DNA, connecting people with their families, whether it's paternity tests or whatever, or matching people up with uh, people who they're connected with in populations in different parts of Akuraka, Akuraka, our people are doing this day in and day out, verifying these things day in and day out. Black geneticists verifying these things day in and day out. But then even before that, the founder, 
the one who started it all, Dr. Herman Branson, most people don't know about, so you can look him up. So when we talk about DNA studies, we're talking about that root that's coming from our people innovating these studies. And then, of course, our people today who are studying these structures themselves. They're not simply reading the literature that's out about DNA, written by the wife and their offspring, and then making some assessments. They're in the labs doing the work themselves and verifying these things themselves. They're not dependent on what somebody else is doing in a lab. They're doing the lab work. So when our people match up, whether it's AfricanAncestry.com or other people match up these DNA structures and show exactly what populations our people are descended from genetically, and we're not talking about spiritually as far as which side of the family the person incarnated from, we can find that out through direct ancestral communication. But the actual Y chromosomal structure or the mitochondrial DNA structure that's within your chromosomes right now, our people are doing those kind of studies and they can show the population we came from. And of course, when people take those DNA tests, they can see what founding population they come from on the continent that destroys all this stupidity about they originated in the Western Hemisphere. They don't come from Apuraka, Apuraka. So um, we only have a few minutes left in the broadcast. is going to cut off because we are already in the overtime section. So we've done some work on this. We did some other broadcasts that touched on this information. We published a note on Facebook talking about those, um, uh, the depopulation of ancient America and the plagues and so forth. You can check that out, and you can do that research yourself. But the key here is this whole notion of African Americans on African pity is born of the whites and their offspring. It's always been a political agenda to dispossess our people of our culture, rooted in the dispossession of our identity. Once we embrace self-hatred and white worship, then we will seek to dispossess ourselves of who we are so that we can align ourselves with our enemies and stay under white rule. This is what every Negro who purports this idiocy that we do not come from Apuraka, Apuraikai, is operating under, is that emotional instability, that deeply ingrained, deeply seated, deeply seated, self-loathing, self-hatred. It is easily exposed and easily eradicated. So again, I say we thank you for tuning in to the broadcast, and yebishya bio, we will meet again. Okay.